Well, welcome everyone. My name is Ross Glatzer. I'm the president of the Eat Smart Live Longer Club in Sun City Hilton Head. And if my friend AJ can show me on the screen, that'll make me think that you're actually hearing me. And tonight, joining me will be ESL member Carla Beck Hansen, who will handle the questions and answers at the end of our meeting, which we think you'll enjoy a lot. Tonight is the 2020 October ESSEL meeting. This has been an extraordinary year for our club and community in the face of COVID. And yet we've been very fortunate in 2020 to have access to eight headline speakers this year. And at this meeting, we have a number of people in attendance who have joined our Friends of ESSEL program. These are people who may have been former club members who have moved away, or perhaps they are your friends or even your family members who would like to get as much healthful information as possible and have access to wonderful speakers like Dr. Ron Weiss tonight. And we would like to say welcome to them. So now let me talk to you for a moment about Dr. Ron Weiss, our featured speaker this, this evening. First of all, in each of the emails that we've sent you over the last few weeks, we wanted to acquaint you with his background, which I am sure he will talk about. But I've often found that what a person says helps to define them. So I found two quotes that I would like to use to introduce Dr. Weiss. Here's the first quote. If I get to say one thing to people to get them to understand why we are here on a farm, it's that food is medicine and food is the most powerful medicine. And the second quote is, food is so powerful in its ability to heal, but also in its ability to cause disease. And it just turns out that's the basis of most people's problems. And I would say this is a pretty good introduction to tonight's presentation that you see on the screen in front of you, Farm to Hospital, How the Way We Farm Makes Us Sick. And I suspect that many of you after this presentation tonight are going to check your GPS to see how far the Ethos Farm, which is Dr. Weiss's farm, is from Bluffton, South Carolina. So to, say, so to save you a moment or two, I checked with Siri and asked Siri, how far is Long Valley, New Jersey from Bluffton, South Carolina? And Siri said, oh, just 775 miles, a mere day trip. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Ron Weiss. Thank you so much for such a glorious introduction, Ross. I am, uh, I'm blushing. My head is exploding with, uh, it's, it's so big. Thank you so much. I want um, to see you. <laughs> well, you know, New Jersey and uh, South Carolina, we, we, were, we were both uh, uh, one of the 13 colonies, right? So yes, we were. The 13 original colonies, so I guess we're bound together like that, at least. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, of all the talks I give, uh, and I, when we were initially communicating, I asked you, you called me up, well, what, what would you like to talk about? This talk is, I think, unique to uh, the, all the presentations that you will see in the plant-based world and health world. Um, you know, I, not that I don't do other things. I, I give a wonderful breast cancer talk. It's, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month and uh, uh, talks on cholesterol and alcohol and all kinds of other things. But this is unique because it really gets to the basis of what we are about and what uh, the work that I've been doing for the past, you know, 20 years which is trying to connect food and the way it is grown to making us better. And so tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to examine 
why our country is so sick. And the reason why is because of the way we farm. That's basically what it boils down to. You know, on the left side of the screen, you see us, uh, you see the industrial uh, production growing of corn, not corn to eat, but corn to feed to CAPO, con concentrated animal feeding operation. And then on the right side of the screen, you know, you see the emergency room with somebody coming in with a heart attack. And I was that ER doctor long ago. And I finally, it struck me that I've got to go from a reactive situation in the ER to, in order to really contribute to health in this country and go back to the very beginning. And that very beginning is the growing of the food that caused that heart attack. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, so I know you're thinking, well, what the hell is a guy from New Jersey know about farming? Why is he talking to us about farming? Well, because New Jersey, uh, our nickname is the Garden State. Uh, even during my childhood, when I was growing up in the 60s, uh, New Jersey was the most productive agricultural state in the nation per acre. We grew more food per acre than California, more produce. We are the market basket state for almost uh, you know, two centuries. We were the state that fed for a local food system ourselves and the great metropolis of Philadelphia and New York City. We were the food basket. The Garden State was known for being top producers of tomatoes, peppers, asparagus, potatoes, sweet corn. Now I'm saying top producers in the United States, right? Even in my childhood in the 1960s, um, green peppers, eggplant capital of the world, a blueberry capital of the world, fresh blueberries, cranberries, peaches, so, uh, and spinach, by the way. So we were really a, a produce basket. Um, now you see me on, on, on my farm. That's in our beautiful green valley here. It's not so green because it's in February when it's cold. And uh, what I am doing is planting an alfalfa cover crop by hand with this rotary seeder. I am walking those fields and frost seeding alfalfa. And this picture illustrates the 180 degrees uh, opposite the scene that we saw here. This is industrialized farming. This is regenerative farming. What do I mean by that? Well, farming is a mining operation for if you really think about it, right? We have beautiful, the earth, the soil, we plant seeds in it, we grow plants, right? Because we're plant eaters and all living things are plant eaters when you come down to it, even uh, you know, indirectly or directly. Plants take energy from the sun and turn it into food. If it weren't for plants, no life would be here. So these plants we grow in the soil, these plants build themselves from the nutrients in the soil, and then we walk off the field with them and leave the soil bereft. That is the mining operation of agriculture. If we are to have soils that continue on from generation to generation, we must regenerate the soil and restore it. And you see me doing this in this picture by planting a crop of alfalfa. It is not for us to eat. It is only for the soil to eat. We plant this and let it grow and let it uh, regenerate and renew the soil. This is missing. This concept is completely missing from 98% of all of our growing activities in the United States today. And that's why we don't have any soil left. Okay. So in this talk, we're going to learn about um, 
we're going to, it's called Farm to Hospital, just so that you're, uh, to organize it for you a little bit. We're going to talk about, start off with about the unsustainable way our healthcare is today. And then we're going to link that to uh, the way we farm and how we create disease causing food and how then that farming goes on to destroy our mothership, our environment. And then we're going to talk about how we got, how did, how did our system develop like that? and how conflicted our, our government is and the agency that controls this policy. And then we're gonna talk about ways we can fix it because I'm an optimist. And if I weren't, you wouldn't see me doing all of this work. You know, I think that uh, Ross intimated to me that most of the audience tonight are seniors. You know, I'm not that far off myself. I'm 58 years old. And um, I don't have to tell you by looking around at your colleagues and, and the society that as you get older, you get sicker in this country. And all the chronic diseases come home to roost and you go to see doctors more and more. And basically what we have is not a healthcare system. It is a medical care system, right? Healthcare systems, which everyone our politicians talk about and everyone thinks we have, which we spend three and a half trillion dollars on, 18% of our total monetary output in this country, should deliver health to people. We develop, we deliver medical care, a lot of drugs, procedures, operations, uh, to, to sustain people in their chronic illnesses like to keep them going with the diabetes, to keep them going with the high blood pressure, that's not health. So <clears throat> on this very expensive system, you can see in this graph, we just keep spending more and more and more. I was born in 1962. Look what happens in the year 1970. All of a sudden, expenditures for hospitals, physicians and clinics, prescription drugs, they start to rise exponentially, especially hospitals. Guess what the Johnson administration uh, initiated, right? In 1960s, just a few years before this, Medicare, which now takes up, it, it is the largest, it has surpassed the Defense Department as the largest expend, federal expenditure that we have. And it's not just Medicare, but all of our medical care system, including what we spend for private insurances and so forth, inexorably rises every year. There's no end in sight. And here you see uh, the last figure in the year for that I have available is for um, 2014, which was five or six years ago. But you see that the United States, it's gone up. It's now like almost 18%, far outspends any other advanced nation in what we get for health health care, medical care, and yet we have some of the poorest outcomes, some of the greatest burden of chronic disease compared to all of the other countries, and by the way, not good life expectancy. And it keeps rising, as I told you. It's the uh, Medicare and Medicaid services uh, expects us to hit 20% of our GDP spending on this medical care. We just cannot continue at this clip where nation's gonna go bankrupt. It'll over, overtake our federal budget someday. And did the Affordable Care Act help us? Well, what's left of it? I know it's being dismantled currently. The answer is no. Health care costs continue to, I'm sorry, medical care costs continue to rise. Look at this chart, which was, uh, uh, you know, sourced by Kaiser that does a lot of research. Look, despite the Affordable Care Act, which came to be in 2015, right, 14, look how family coverage still continues to balloon, single coverage continues to balloon. Since in the past 20 years, uh, a family health care policy 
has about quadrupled in cost, quadrupled in 20 years, not sustainable. Okay. And if you look at this chart, uh, which is a recent chart, you know, our, lay, our, our wages, workers' wages barely keep up with inflation. And yet, despite the fact we paid so much extra in premiums, medical insurers have shifted additional costs to us because in the past 10 years, our deductibles uh, have risen by 150%. That's before we get any of those benefits from that expensive health insurance we're paying. When I started off giving this talk a few years ago, one in two Americans right here had a chronic disease. One in four, 25%, had more than one. This year, now six in 10 have a chronic disease and four in 10 have two or more. So chronic disease, just in a few years, it continues to skyrocketing. And I want you to take a look at this chart to see what a chronic disease is considered as by the CDC. It's heart disease, cancer, chronic lung diseases like asthma and emphysema, strokes, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and one of the new ones, which appeared this year or last year by the CDC, chronic kidney disease. It's now an epidemic. This chronic kidney disease is caused by our food, folks. These diseases cause seven out of 10 deaths in America every year. And it's responsible for 86% of that three and a half trillion dollars. If we could just all eat plants without poison on it, we could save trillions of dollars a year, it's estimated, and spend it on something else that we really need. So. I think after presenting to this to you, any reasonable person would think that we are in a crisis of healthcare, right? Crisis. A lot of people, they don't, they will say, they will give different reasons for this crisis, like, oh, drugs are too expensive. Okay. Yes, that's true. The, the number one um, um, responsibility for that rise in healthcare premiums are climbing drug costs. But I'm telling you, that's not the primary reason. You could, might say primary care is functionally dead in this country. Primary care doctors are going out of business. Medical students are not going into, medical, into, into internal medicine or family practice or pediatrics anymore. That's why we train them on our farm. You can see the projected shortages are just in about a few years in this country. And the reason why that increases healthcare costs is because primary care doctors help to prevent problems and treat patients economically as compared to specialists. But that's not the primary cause. You can say there's a health insurance problem. People don't have health insurance. They access our care system late when it, the disease costs are astronomical. True, but that's not the primary cause. This is the primary cause, the United States Department of Agriculture, because the policies of this body determine what we grow. And here you see it, here in this picture, combines are harvesting industrially uh, thousands of acres of wheat. That wheat is turned into this meal that you see in, in front of you. And you know, as plant eaters, you know what kinds of disease this lunch causes, or it ends up, that food ends up going to supply these restaurants. If you walk down any main street today in America, this is where the standard American diet is served. So let's say to yourself, okay, yeah, I know that Dr. Weiss. You know, I know eating bologna and processed meats is not good. I know going to fast food restaurants is not good for you. So let me go to the supermarket and I'll go shop for myself and I'll make a nice healthy meal at home, right? Isn't that where the beginning of food preparation begins? At home, we'll get away from the garbage. Okay, you walk into your supermarket. This is what it looks like. 
If you are serious about preventing cancer and heart disease, 80% of the shelves on the standard American uh, supermarket are off limits strictly to you. And it's because our government policies made our supermarkets look like this. Let's talk about the main crops that we grow in this country, because 93% of everything we grow, do you know, is not for us to eat. Only about 7% of what is grown here in this country ends up actually being food like vegetables, fruits, seeds, nuts, the kind of stuff we eat, right? Plant eat eaters, healthy eaters, whole grains that end up actually being fed to human beings. So the two top crops that we grow in this country, which combine, make up, ooh, maybe 400 million acres uh, is corn and soybean. We're gonna talk about corn first. When I started giving this talk about four years ago, it was for decades corn, and now two years ago, soybeans overtook corn. Uh, here's a, just for those of you who don't, are not familiar with the corn problem that we have in our country, you know, when you're thinking about the average person who's not into agriculture is thinking about corn, they're thinking, okay, I'm getting corn niblets from Green Giant, or in the summertime, I'm getting an ear of corn, I'm biting on it. That only makes up a tiny little fraction, sweet corn, of the corn that's grown in this country. Like 98% of it is made up by corn that we don't eat. It's called field corn. Like, for example, in Indiana, which is a major corn growing state, uh, this was from the, their state fair one year. They grew 42 million uh, pounds of this corn that you were eat, used to eating and 49 billion pounds of the food, the corn that you don't eat. Where does that stuff go? It goes here to concentrated animal feeding operations. This is the basis of our animal diet, our, our standard American diet, which is an animal-based, not plant-based diet. And what we have done is, uh, and we'll find out how this occurred, but you know, when I was growing up, and I know when you guys are growing up, if you're seniors, you know, when you were growing up in the 50s or maybe 40s, you know, if you had a piece of meat, it came from a cowboy. <laughs> it's okay. Cowboys raised cows, right? It was expensive to get steak, a piece of meat, because a cowboy had to drive cattle drives and they had to be watch the cows on ranges and grass. 98% of all the cows and meat and that's, that's grown ends up being grown in warehouses like this, these massive industrialized operations. And animals, in order to be fed and warehoused in these need, industrialized delivery of calories. And that's what this corn has become. And we're gonna see in a moment, the soy. <laughs> that's what it's being grown for. And um, these cows were not, they didn't evolve to eat this stuff. They're, they're herbivores, they're, they're they eat grass, but it doesn't matter. We just feed them this stuff they, that gets them sick, this grain. And in order to do that, you have to pump them full of chemicals and antibiotics to prevent them from dying. It's a mess. And here's what I want to remind you as you're looking at these pictures to bring this up to our current day. Just to remind you that this country and this world has been exposed to a pandemic. The pandemic of COVID-19. Where did this COVID-19 come from? Well, this COVID-19 came from an animal market, a live animal market, had something to do with uh, improperly handling animals or, you know, uh, jiggering the relationship, the natural relationship of how animals come into contact with each other. And because of this, we know because of this pandemic, that there are pandemics waiting in the wings to strike us. It is not if, it is when. And there is a pandemic 
which is coming from, you see that left, that left lower corner, that chicken house? It is called bird flu. It, it makes this COVID-19 look like child's play. Uh, we're all afraid of dying from COVID-19 and ending up in a ventilator. Just to put this into um, perspective, the COVID-19 has a fraction of a percent chance of killing you. Bird flu, when it comes, and it is coming, it will kill 60% of the people it infects. And that's, that's something that the world will not be able to get over. It will come from one of these concentrated animal feeding operations, which is supported by the, the USDA's agricultural policies. So um, let's take a look at what is being fed to these animals, just so that you're aware. Um, and by the way, uh, if you're eating meat or chicken or, or fish in this country, did you know that 98, or pigs or pork, that 98% of your food comes from facilities of this? Only 2% of animal foods eat consumed in the United States comes from either organic sources or non-industrialized warehouses like this. So here's what goes into these animals that, that are being fed to, you know, what goes fed, what's being fed to them. It was analyzed by Johns Hopkins, the Bloomberg School of Public Health a couple of years ago, and they put out this detailed analysis. So the number one thing that makes up their feed rations are the grains I told you about, that feed field corn. But you have to remember there are other grains, sometimes millet uh, to a smaller degree or amaranth is mixed in there but it's mostly that corn. Number two, oil, meals, and cakes. What does this mean? Well, remember I told you that soy now has overtaken corn as the leader crop production in the United States. Why are we growing that? Well, this is why, because we take those soybeans, and don't fool yourself, we're not making it into edamame or tofu for the most part. That's only a fraction of what this, product, this production goes for. We're taking this soybean and we press it to get all of the oil about, and we're gonna talk about what happens to that oil. And the rest that's left over after the oil, the, the bean matter that's left, goes in to make a cake and meal. And that's the other major portion of the feed ingredients for this CAFO. Next, the third, third most common ingredient is rendered animal products. So you have to remember there are billions and billions of animals being uh, slaughtered in these facilities every year. And we only take a small part of the animal, the meat to eat. You have to think of the skeleton, the hair, the, the feathers, the bones, the claws, the skin, the, you know, all of the stuff that's the, the, the other non-edible portions of the animal, that is not wasted. Uh, if we had, if we were to construct a four lane superhighway, uh, like 80, from California to New Jersey, uh, and, and fill it up with all of the, the animal byproducts that were coming from these facilities, it would bumper to bumper, uh, need a four lane highway of tractor trailer trucks to hold all of the materials, the bones, the skin, the, the other materials, byproducts. So this stuff is valuable. It is taken to rendering facilities. It is cooked down and to uh, and ground up and then fed back to the animals. So cows are eating cows. Chickens are eating cows. Cows are eating chickens. You know, these are basically, a lot of these animals are herbivores. And as you recycle animal into animal into animal, this recycles toxic metals, industrial pollutants. They become extremely uh, concentrated in these toxic elements. The next ingredient in the CAFO uh, food chain is 4D animals. 4D stands for dead, dying, disabled, or downed, animals that fall down in the warehouse and can't get up. These are proved to be slaughtered and then put into the, uh, the uh, 
food chain ingredients to feed uh, CAFO animals. These animals produce enormous amounts of manure and waste. It can't be used. This is poured into the feed of the next generation of animals. And last, of course, you know, you're, these, there's no way these animals can exist like this in an environment without constant support from antibiotics, drugs, and the most, perhaps the most disturbing thing I found out after carefully reviewing this report is that in the last week of life for these beef cattle who are in these facilities, they are fed two kilos of tiny plastic beads because they get so little fiber that they can't move their bowels adequately because they're not eating grass. And so they give them little plastic pellets to move through their colon. So upon execution, they, 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 they can move out their bowels and not have stool fecal contaminant of the meat when they're slaughtered. And that plastic goes back to feed the animals. So all of these poisons are recycled generation to generation. This is what Americans are eating in the standard American diet. This makes the majority of their caloric intake. Oh. This is a monoculture of soybeans, number one crop today. There is not anything else alive in this field except for this one plant that's been cloned genetically in a laboratory from, for miles around in this field. What chance does a butterfly have? What chance does a bird have? Constantly driven by poisons, chemicals, there's no life in this soil. This is what my farm was when I got here. It, was, it looked like this. So we're gonna talk about soybeans now. Let's take a look. If you wonder why we have such epidemics of chronic disease and why uh, those, those healthcare uh, um, diagrams I showed you in the beginning are so scary, you only have to look at how our diet has changed since 1970. Remember I showed you that those expenditures took off about that time, okay? Look how the American diet has changed since 1970, okay? So first of all, the consumption of beef has been uh, replaced with a, uh, a uh, equivalent rise in the consumption of chicken, right? Because there was a campaign to stop eating red meat. And then all these birds by the millions, millions and millions were, were put into these facilities. When I was growing up, there were still small chicken farms in New Jersey. Uh, they, were, they were common near the shore. Not one of them is left. There were little chicken farms, like family chicken farms. All chickens are grown in this facility. And this is where the next pandemic is coming from. You know that when Biden was vice president, you know that there was a swine flu outbreak that threatened our nation. It came from a pig facility in the United States, in, in, in the Midwest. And now we're waiting for the bird flu to come from one of these chicken houses. Here you go, here's the chicken we're eating. But I want you to look here. So when you, it's not just eating animal foods. Remember, whole food plant-based eating and eating healthy is not just vegan. You can get pretty sick eating vegan. And one of the reasons is because of this. Look what has happened since 1970 to our consumption of oils. Can you believe that? And guess where the number one oil is coming from? Soybeans. Remember I told you, the first thing that is done after our number one crop is taken out of that field is it's pressed to get its valuable oil. Cows don't eat that oil, we eat that oil. And I want to show you this chart. I'm just gonna make a couple of comments because it's such a beautiful chart before I get to the, the main show, which is the linoleic acid in soybean. But this is a, a nice chart of the fat components of different oils and fats, the, the components 
of the makeup of the fat that we eat. If anyone ever tells you that coconut oil is a miracle, that it's good for you, just show them to this chart. Coconut oil has, is 92% saturated fat. Saturated fat is, is an enormous cause of disease in this country. Look how much lard has. It's only, it's half that amount. You're better off eating a brick of lard than you are this, an ounce of lard, uh, give it to me, I'll eat it before I eat an ounce of coconut. So I just want to show you on this because it's so clearly pointed out on this chart. Um, but I want, now want to draw your attention to um, this, the blue areas of this chart. Because the blue areas are linoleic acid, the component of linoleic acid that make up common fats that we eat. What is linoleic acid? Linoleic acid, I know we've all heard about omega-3s, right? Is that correct? A lot of us try to get omega-3s. A lot of us who eat plants are aware that omega-3s are in flaxseed and walnuts and chia seed. Um, and um, we know that fish oils have omega-3s because fish eat green algae. The fish don't make them themselves. They eat the green algae. The green algae makes the omega-3s. But let me be clear uh, that uh, the plant sources of the omega-3s, like flaxseed and chia, they're short chain omega-3s the long chain omega-3s, which are, which are constructed from that sh uh, short chains, are really valuable, especially as we get older, when we're senior citizens, we, and, and all th stages of life, by the way, when you're a pregnant woman, pregnant, ha taking um, uh, prenatal vitamins, you'll always see it says DHA, EPA on it. Those are the long chains. They're fortified because it's important to build fetuses' brains. It's important to build children's brain. In midlife, it's important for, to keep our brains from shrinking, and definitely when we're senior citizens. We know that if we don't get, our brains thrive on these long chain omega-3s, and if we don't get enough of them, it does decrease our memory capacity and executive cognitive function. So it is linoleic acid, which is an omega-6, that runs contrary to these threes, and that's why I'm bringing it up now. Every time you take in a linoleic acid, you're countering the action of the thing that you want most in your brain, which is omega-3s long chain. And just so that you understand, remember I said that, uh, remember I said before that, you know, walnuts, right? I mentioned those plant foods that we all love to eat for omega-3s. Take a look at this, walnuts. Did you know they have more omega-6s than omega-3s? That's right. So every time you eat a walnut, you're giving yourself more of these, these bad molecules than the good. The only foods on this planet that really have a more good than bad, more short chain omega-3s than the 6s are flax, chia, and hemp seed. Okay. I want to draw your attention to soybeans. Soybean oil has some of the highest component of this linoleic acid. And we're going to see why that's so important in a moment. I just want to show you the trends over the, over the 20th century of major cons consumption of major food uh, commodities in our, our diet. Look at all the oils. Yeah, for a hundred years, nothing really ever happened to them. Soybeans, skyrocketing. When? Oh, about 1970, <laughs> right? And here's some other oils. There are other oils that started picking up. You know, we didn't really go anywhere with olive oil, corn oil, but you know, some other oil started picking up, but look what's happening lately. Canola oil is really shooting up. In the, during the 20th century, 
Soybean oil consumption increased by 116,000%. Even olive oil, only uh, we increased our consumption of by 500%, 116,000%. That's a major change. In fact, from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which is the leading uh, nutrition journal, science journal we have, this statement, the most striking modification to the American diet in the last century is the greater than 1,000 fold increase in the estimated per capita, that means each one of us, what we consume of soybean oil. This has got to have some kind of effect on our health, and it does. I'm gonna show you the effect. When you go, uh, we have adipose fat, you know, we didn't start growing this soybean, please be aware of it, until 1970. We, we weren't growing soybeans in this country. Uh, and when we analyze fat biopsies, which have been in storage from, from the 1950s and analyze it and compare it to fat storage or adipose tissue uh, biopsies that have been taken today, we say, see enormous um, uh, concentrations, three times that amount over the past 50 or 60 years of this linoleic acid. It's accumulating in us. Does that have a bad effect on us? I'm gonna show you that it does. When we take, bre we have breast milk that's been sampled from pregnant women and breastfeeding mothers from the 1950s, and we compare it to breast milk samples from American women today, again, we are feeding our breastfed infants three times the amount of linoleic acid now as compared to breast milk from the 1950s. Why is this bad? Because linoleic acid is a driver of heart disease. That's why. When you cut open on autopsy an artery of someone who has heart, had a heart attack and you analyze that atherosclerotic junk that's clogging the arteries. I know, please listen to Dr. Esselstyn's lecture someday. Has Dr. Esselstyn talked to you guys, Ross? I hope so. You should get him if, if he hasn't. But you'll see he goes over these plaques. When you look and analyze these plaques, the number one most abundant fat is linoleic acid, okay? Um, number two, we now know that the Darth Vader of, of cholesterol, the worst kind of cholesterol is just not LDL, bad cholesterol. It is oxidized damage LDL cholesterol. And this linoleic acid that's, that's in our bodies, it's, it lights the fire to start oxidizing LDL. I, when we have patients come to us, we check their oxidized LDL. It's not a common test but we, we do it because we seek this as a major thing that we wanna drive down in patients. Oxidized, damaged LDL, just not regular LDL. Damaged LDL is a major driver of prostate cancer, breast cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and heart attack. It's like, as I said, Darth Vader. And it all, this process all starts from this linoleic acid. Let's, this last thing, I, I made a, there's a little typo here. Do you remember I, I sh sh showed you that chart in the beginning say, and you remember this, like our, 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 our USDA for years, decades have been saying, hey, and American Heart Association, hey, saturated fats are bad. Hey, eat less red meat, right? Eat more fish, eat more margarine. Don't, don't eat saturated fats, eat polyunsaturated fats eat like oils, vegetable oils, right? Uh, we have found out that the, over all these decades that you're worse off eating those oils than the saturated fats that come from meat. And I'm sorry, this was switched. It should say substitution of dietary linoleic acid for dietary saturated fats has been demonstrated to, to, uh, with an increase in deaths from coronary artery disease cardiovascular events like strokes, and of, from all causes of death. So we've actually been driven backwards, as you can see, uh, as far as our health status.
from diseases of all cause that cause all, all forms of death. Linoleic acid is now thought to be a major cause of our obesity and diabetes epidemic. You know that we have an obesity diabetic, uh, uh, right? Uh, obesity epidemic, and it keeps rising inexorably every year. We can't stop it. Um, uh, it's now thought that the majority of Americans are overweight, and more than one third of us are obese. Just to put this in terms of our current day, uh, for those of you who know what a body mass index is, it's, a, it's your height times weight and you get a number. And this number, uh, there are ranges for underweight, normal weight, overweight, obese, extremely obese. To be of a normal weight, you've got to have a body mass index of between 18 and 24. Less than 18 is underweight. 18 or 19 to 24 is normal weight. The Amer average American today is 28. He's, he and she are in the overweight category. That's the average American. The CDC just published data showing that a body mass index of 28, if you get infected with COVID-19, gives you six times the mortality rate. Six times. Do you see why we're dying and have such a problem in this country with COVID-19? If we all had a normal body weight average, like 23, yeah, the COVID-19 would hit us, but it wouldn't kill us. We could get over it. We can't because it, it causes this, all this mortality because of our obesity and overweight diabetic, uh, overweight epidemic. So how does this linoleic acid cause or is associated with this weight gain? Well, linoleic acid is the precursor of arachidonic acid. The arachidonic acid is the beginning of the anti, the, I'm sorry, inflammatory chain of events in our body. If any of you have ever taken a Motrin pill, an Aleve pill, an Advil pill, a naproxen pill, you know, these are called anti-inflammatories. Doctors give them to people if they have a headache or arthritis, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because they interfere with arachidonic acid. That's the beginning of the inflammatory path pathway. That's why they call these drugs anti-inflammatory. So what happens is linoleic acid creates arachidonic acid and arachidonic acid is the backbone of what's called the endocannabinoid pathway. See this cannabinoid? Yes, pot. We have receptors in us for marijuana, cannabis, and we have these receptors very similar to them in our central nervous system that control our metabolism, our hunger, our drive to eat. And we now think that this linoleic acid is creating so much arachidonic acid that is binding to this, these uh, marijuana receptors you know, smoking marijuana gives you the munchies, right? It makes you want to eat. And it completely changes what you want to eat, how you want to eat, how much you want to eat, and your metabolism. And now we're finding it out, it has a separate role in the development of diabetes and insulin resistance, other than making you eat more and, and lowering your basal metabolic rate. Of course, as I said before, once you become overweight, then you're set up for COVID-19 deaths, heart attacks, cancer, diabetes, liver disease. Everything comes from being overweight. So this is why we need a medical care system to take care of all of this enormous disease. But, you know, when I started off on this journey, you know, I, obviously I was a physician. A physician's primary role is to reverse things, or at least a, you know, a lifestyle medicine physician, right? That's what my job is, to, to take, prevent this. And if I find people who have cardiovascular disease and diabetes, to reverse it. Um, however, because our earth is so sick now from all of this food that's been grown, actually 
I think that this is not the triage emergency anymore. Our mothership, our planet's health is now the triage emergency. Everything we've been talking about with our own human health, our individual take, health, takes a back seat. Because if we don't save our planet, our children and grandchildren will have nothing to, no substrate 30 years from now. So I'm gonna go over some of the effects of the way our government's policy in farming, farming has had on our planet's health to see how destructive it is and why we must change now. We've got to change now. And at the end, I'm gonna give you these solutions. Ready? Okay. How this farming makes our planet sick, okay? Well, see that red zone uh, emptying out from the, in the Mississippi basin? That's all the, the water the, from the Mississippi that drains our corn soybean belt. That's fertilizer that creates a dead zone the size of my state of New Jersey. That's that red. There is nothing alive in there. There are no fish. There is no sea life. It is just algae. That's it. Uh, so uh, the fertilizers used to create these monocultures are destroying our oceans. Last year, the UN issued a, a dire report that, are, that there is up to a million species within the next couple of decades that are facing extinction. And of them, 40% of all insect species may be threatened with extinction in the coming decades. We, a third of all of our plants that we eat are pollinated by these insects we will not have any food to eat if these insects go extinct. In those great fields that you saw growing, they're constantly plied with insecticides uh, and biocides that kill everything from the milkweed that is needed to uh, support this great creature, the monarch, which is in the process of going extinct, extinct to killing the monarchic itself with direct applications of pesticides. The other thing you have to remember is that, um, you know, we farm so intensively with these chemicals and these lands and, the, and, these, and these fertilizers that we've wiped out all kinds of refuges for native species. Like when you see the fires burning like the Amazon, like we did earlier in the year, which still continues, you know, that's places where wild things could live. Uh, they're gone. They're just replaced with corn and soybean. These farming practices that I showed you about with those miles of, of corn and soybean, they cause climate change. You know, I know that if you turn on the news, they'll say that the burning of fossil fuels is the major reason why we have climate change. Guess what? It's not. The outgassing of carbon into the atmosphere from the Earth's soils creates 10 times the amount of CO2 emissions into the air than does all of the oil, gas, Anything you want to burn in this planet, coal, wood, all the fossil fuels you have, 10 times that amount. And we're outgassing that because of the way we treat the soil with our agriculture and destruction of our land. The tillage of soil, the plowing of our soil, every time a farmer comes and cuts open the soil, billions of li microbial lives are lost, trillions in every square inch. You know carbon goes into the atmosphere. The application of chemicals causes outgassing of, uh, and, and climate change. And of course, we mentioned the destruction of nat native habitat. Of course, to maintain such a system like this that's supported by our government, you, you, can, you can't do it because it's so unnatural. You can't grow one plant over a million acres, just like you can't have a, a thousand chickens 
in like a room and have them survive without support, chemical support. You can't do that in a natural environment. So of course, we're drowning in all these pesticides and, and chemicals. And they are now being measured in the rain. When we go outside, it rains. All of this stuff is coming down on us. It's not, it, it doesn't have a short half-life. In a raindrop, all of this stuff is in, in our drinking water, in our shower water. We water our plants with it and it's growing. Its concentration is growing with every year. Here, this is measured by the US Geological Survey. They measure this stuff in fog on the Rocky Mountains, in rain, in the snow. These pesticides and chemicals that are falling on us have been clearly linked to cancer, uh, birth defects. Uh, uh, there's a strong association now with the rise of autism in our children, ADD, diabetes, and the list goes on because these chemicals, when they are on our food and we eat them, even if it's plant foods, they change our, they don't change our genes, but they control our genes. And then we pass these genes down to our children and then it causes the disease in our children. That's called epigenetics. And that may be why we're seeing increased autism rates in the last generation. It's because, you know, we started applying all these chemicals in the 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, when I was a kid, not so much autism, in my children's generation, in the 90s, the 2000s, a lot of autism. It climbs every year. How did we get into this mess? How did we get here? It all starts with the Depression. So until the Great Depression, farmers basically were kind of on their own in the United States. And our food system was based on the family farm. It was generally a diverse farm. You know, there were a lot of farms. The, the farmers, you know, basically you had some chickens, you grew some wheat, you had some vegetables. You know, you had a lot of things going on your farm. And then, the, then through the roaring 20s, a lot of farmers overextended themselves. They took out a lot of loans and mortgages. And then the Great Depression hit. And in 19... 31, I believe, or 30, in that second year of the Depression, 400,000 American farms went under. And Roosevelt and the New Deal decided to create the AAA, the Agricultural Assistance Act. You know, it was one of the New Deal Acts. And what the objective was this is so that we could continue to feed ourselves, the federal government stepped in with all kinds of mechanisms like price supports. They would control the markets and tell farmers, organize them to see, okay, don't grow so much of that. We have too much of that. Grow more of this. They'd pay farmers not to. If we, they realized that uh, there was too much of a crop, they'd give them subsidies that pay them not to farm so that they could stay in business for another year. And so that's what was the beginning of subsidies for farmers, the real beginning. And that remained into effect and it was okay. It, you know, it, it brought us through most of the 20th century until the Nixon administration. And in the Nixon administration in 1972, he appointed uh, the agriculture secretary, Earl Butts. And he, in a major way, if there's one individual who's really responsible, I believe, for changing our food system, if you had to pick one person, I mean, I know it's hard, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard. It's like, you can pick one person to talk about the Holocaust, like it was probably Hitler. Although I know there were a lot of people involved, but if, if you had to pick one person to, if you had to narrow it down to that, to as a cause to why our obesity epidemic is here, all this disaster that I showed you, it's Earl Butts regarding our food system. And the reason why is because he completely changed the way we farm. He had two mantras. Those mantras, which are I, some of you may remember, was plant fence row to fence row and get big or get out. 
that family farm that I showed you was supported by the federal government? He said, no more. You need to, you need to grow commodities, not food. You need to grow soybeans, you know, that we're not going to eat, but we need to construct industrialized facilities to become more efficient producers of protein, like animal proteins. We need to grow all this corn to feed to them. And you need to apply, you can't, you need to expand your farms to thousands of acres, not to 200. And you need to grow one crop. And you need to use more chemicals to do that. And that's how we got, got where we are. You know, if you remember, I, I don't know if, I know all of you have heard of Farm Aid with Willie Nelson. You know, it's been going on for a quarter of a century. It was big in the 1980s, which is about 10 years after Earl Butts's policies were put into effect. In the 10 years after this, family farms were devastated. They were going out of business. Willie Nelson's farm aid still exists today to create, uh, they raise millions of dollars with these concerts to try and keep smaller family farms growing corn and soybean afloat. They just can't make it because they don't get really the subsidies that the huge industrialized, you know, or agribusinesses get to grow this crap that you see making us sick. This is what I see when I look at Earl Butts's legacy. He was quoted uh, when he was uh, agriculture secretary as saying, before we go back to organic agriculture, which is by the way, you know, we had that be before World War I. You realize we fed our country without application of pesticides and chemicals before this. We did have a nation. I told you we were the garden state. How did we become like that? We fed Philadelphia, New York plenty before World War I. We didn't have chemicals, you know, for all intents and purposes. He said, before we go back to organic agriculture, somebody is going to have to decide which 50 million people we are going to let starve. And that idea has taken hold in, in our farming and agriculture department in our world to discount the way, a, a healthy way to produce food. Nobody believes we can do it. Ethos Farm Project believes the opposite. We're trying to prove it every day. And I'm going to show you what we're doing towards that end. This legacy has produced this. This is what our main street looks like. This is what our supermarket looks like. And it has produced this. our sick nation. And as if this is not upsetting enough, of course, the, 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 gov the agency that's running all of this, this policy is the USDA. You know, the United States Department of Agriculture was a, a, originally set up to benefit farmers, to be a professional advocacy organization. So it's like their main goal is to make sure that their members the farmers make, get a paycheck and, and produce and that agriculture is going. But of course, if you have someone like Earl Butts having arranged stuff like this, uh, they, they are also creating very unhealthy food. And at the same time, the USDA about a hundred years ago was given the responsibility of deciding what healthful nutrition is. And of course, there's a big conflict of interest. On one hand, you have the USDA telling people to grow poison. And on the other hand, you have them making recommendations for what healthy food is. It doesn't work out. Like here, like they, the US, USDA has a market program, which is funded from farmers that helps uh, processed food makers find ways to pack our, our food system with more cheese in it finds ways to feed our children more feed, more cheese, to put it into our school lunch program. They find ways to try and figure out how we can turn more of this corn into soda, which is now the number one item in food stamp uh, uh, recipients shopping cart. It's soda. This is what we pay for in these entitlements. It's not eating 
vegetables, it's eating soda and processed food that come from that system. That's the number one item. And when you think about it, you know, I talked before that, you know, if we could just wave, wave, wave a magic wand, if I, Dr. Weiss were made the king of America, and it was absolute rule, and I could wave a magic wand and make everyone eat plants, we'd have these trillions of dollars, right, left over, because no one would be, we wouldn't have to take care of these chronic illnesses anymore. But that's not a reality. Uh, and, the, and the sad part is, is that we have so many people who are sick and people who don't have access to doctors and health insurance, but giving them a Medicare for all or a more medical care system will just make us go bankrupt faster because you're not accounting for all the money that has to be spent on this medical care system to take care of all these problems, right? Medicare is going broke. Giving Medicare to even more sick people is not the answer. It's removing the sickness. And that begins with changing our farming and food production system. So I've put this up there and I see this as coming in our future, just like I see this bird flu coming. America has a choice. We can either overhaul our agriculture policy and food system, or we can ration medical care. We can't have both. We saw medical care. I saw medical care being rationed in the pandemic. I've taken care of about 4,000 COVID-19 patients. I've sent some of them home who were dying because there were not enough ventilators to take care of them. That was rationing of medical care. We didn't have enough. If we do neither of these, our government and our nation will be bankrupted by a tidal wave of chronic disease. What is the solution? We must change what we grow in this country. We must change the way we grow it. And we need on a, on a policy level to incentivize people to eat whole plant foods. Today, we incentivize people to eat Cheetos. This is what we incentivize people to eat. It's on the left. All the farm subsidies, all the billions of billions, billions of dollars that your tax dollars go to, to build, to ultimately pay for this white flour, that soy and corn create the food on the left. And there you go, see it. Look at that hamburger bun. That's the wheat that was grown in that picture. There you go. The potatoes that ends up at French fries. The number one vegetable people eat in America is French fries. There you go. There's the pigs, the bacon, the pepperoni, the cheese, um, you know, the fried chicken, the hamburgers, the, the dairy products, the cheese. So 97% of all of our agricultural production goes for that, and 7% goes to the right. Everything on the left is supported by our subs by federal USDA subsidies. Nothing on the right, not one berry is supported by agricultural subsidies. If you eat a plant-based diet like you see on the right, you are not being subsidized, your diet. If you eat any of the stuff on the left, everything is subsidized. We've got to change the way we grow. You know, we can't, we can't keep killing the earth and killing our soils with chemicals. Our life comes from the soils. And that's why we partner with the Rodale Institute. Rodale Institute is the inventor of organic agriculture in the United States. They termed that, they coined that term organic. And now they have a new term called regenerative. If anyone wants to ask me about what that means, I can take a question in the, in the, in the uh, Q&A. Did you know there's a new certification coming out? It's, it's almost upon us. It's called regenerative organic. Organic is not good enough anymore. We should incentivize people to eat more plant, whole plant foods. Our government should do this. Did you know in South Africa, 
there was a program that was funded by the largest health insurance company. It covered hundreds of thousands of people. It gave them five, the health insurance company gave them a stipend of $500 per month per family. Do you know how much vegetables that buys? $500 per month. They could buy any whole plant foods they wanted to. It was extremely popular. It had excellent health outcomes. We could do that instead of giving our subsidies the way we do. Give everybody $500. Like Andrew Yang wanted to give everyone $1,000, $1,200, whatever a month. Just give everyone $500 and let them, let them if they want to buy plant foods. You know, not telling people not to eat chicken. Just buy plants. Got to start one step at a time. Okay. Walter Willett from the Harvard School of Public Health was the lead author on this Eat Lancet Commission. This was the first time in human history that a, a team of scientists got, be, got together and made a recommendation. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but do you know that this was put before the UN that the only way that we can survive by 2050 and feed the Earth's population without annihilating ourselves is to eat a plant-based diet that's grown without pesticides. The UN is adopting this now based on this recommendation. So things, people are listening. And I know you know this because you think, see people eating more plants around you. It's possible. We just got to get all of our friends on board. And that's why we have the Ethos Farm Project. The Ethos Farm Project is, uh, we created this nonprofit and it does things like raise new farmers. We bring new farmers to our land, young people who want to be farmers, and we teach them. We raise new farmers to grow like this because there's no one, our old farmers are you know, retiring and there are not enough young farmers to grow our food for our children and grandchildren. We have a major research project which examines how growing um, growing food well regeneratively and planting native plants can be the solution to climate change. Remember what I told you, our earth soils outgas more CO2 than burning all the fossil fuels. Well, we have evidence on our farm and we're involved in a, a trial to show that that can be reversed. We can get rid of climate change. And we have Ethos Farm Days. If any of you I know, you know, COVID-19 put an end to it this year, but last year we had an amazing series of events with Dr. Esselstyn and Colin Campbell and, you know, Saray Stancic and all the fantastic leaders in the plant-based world. Once a month we convene on the farm, and this is something you should drive the 740 miles to when we have them again, maybe hopefully at the end of 2021, where you come to the farm, we have this, it's like a festival where you have great plant-based food, listen to the speakers, have all kinds of demonstrations, maybe a beautiful concert. It's a wonderful, wonderful lifting experience. And we educate the public. People flew from Montana for this one day, for, you know, from, from Texas. And hopefully, once the pandemic over is over, we're going to turn it into an entire weekend event, like a destination event. The one thing we need more than hope is action, as per Greta Thunberg, the young lady who appeared before the UN. Act, act. Act by being a light and, and convincing people to grow whole food plant-based, to, to eat whole food plant-based. If you ever want to follow us on, we have wonderful Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts. Uh, our, you see our Instagram is at Dr. Ron Weiss. We, you can, even if you're in South Carolina, you can always see beautiful pictures of the farm. We tell you what we're doing on the farm. That Facebook is Ethos Health. And we have beautiful testimonies on our website of, of, uh, and you know, all kinds of interesting webinars we post at ethoshealth.org. And so I'm gonna, I know I went, ran a little bit over, 15 minutes maybe. We're going to just, while I take some Q&A, we're going to show you some beautiful pictures of our farm. Yes, that is New Jersey, folks, from the air. That's our farm. It's green. We live in a green valley. That's the Garden State. 
It's not all oil refineries. That this is one hour from Manhattan, believe it or not. So enjoy the pictures, and I'll take Q and A, Ross. If you want to, if you want to moderate that, I will. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Carla Beck Hansen, and she will um, ask you and feed you the questions. I just want to say you did a tremendous job, and I also want to remind uh, our audience, and you'll find it interesting. The speaker after you is named Caldwell Esselstyn, mm -hmm. and he'll be here on November 19th. And the one after that is somebody named Joel Furman uh, on December 17th. And I know you. I know. Well, I stand on both. I stand on the shoulders of both those men. Both of them should get the, the Nobel Prize in medicine. They should both. That they is tremendous. By the way, I just had somebody, one of our members, send a note that said, I'm proud to be from. I am proud to be from New Jersey, Mercy, Mercer County. <laughs> right, home of the Mercer runabout. If any of you ever saw, uh, you know, that, that car about 100 years ago, the Mercer runabout, one, once, one of the fastest cars ever in existence, was made in Mercer County outside Trenton. It was a little sports car made in the first decade of the 20th century. Hello, Mercer County. All right, so Carla, if you would take it from here. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Weiss, for that very informative uh, presentation. Since food is medicine, uh, do you have any follow-up data where you track the progress of patients once they switch to a whole food plant-based diet? And since they're getting better, they're going to the doctor less frequently. So do, can you quote any percentages of what you would classify as success and what percentage revert back to SAD? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that is an excellent question, uh, which has many answers. Uh, the, the bottom line is that, you know, with the advent of the electronic medical record, you know, it's possible to collect data. Mm -hmm. because, because before, you know, 15, 20 years ago, everything was on papers <laughs> in, in file rooms. Who, who, could, who could do that? But now we can. We have not collated or, collect or, or, or gone through that data. We would need, you know, we need, we'd need a team of people, of analysts and researchers to do that, which we don't. So I don't have those specific numbers for you, but it could be done. Hey, do I hear any volunteers in our events? <laughs> yeah. So to go through a database, I would like to do that someday. Okay. But in, in a more general way, I can tell you this. Here's my experience. There are all kinds of people who come to us. I would say 50% of people who come to Ethos Primary Care don't even, under, you know, they're just standard American diet eaters. And 50% are already plant-based. And they're all levels of dedication. What is most determinant of success is the dedication and consistency of the patient. It's not the disease they have. It's not necessarily the program. Although we think we have a, we think, of course, I'm biased. We have the best program that there is because we've refined it over many decades uh, to get somebody to be at a sustaining, consistent, high level of lifestyle change and nutritional change. Uh, but hey, look, I could have two people who come to me. A person who keeps derailing and keeps eating, you know, cheeseburgers, who wants to change but they can't, and somebody who walks away from cheeseburgers and is high level all the time, 100%, hits every, you know, it depends who you are and what you're goals are. So um, mm -hmm. all I can tell you is to sum that up is that if you are dedicated, you will be successful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, in some of the other literature I read that Ross sent out prior to your presentation, um, you mentioned your Ascent to Wellness program. Could you briefly tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, so, yeah, so we're a primary care practice, 
but we're more than just a primary care practice because in a regular conventional primary care practice, people come to the doctor and say, oh, you have a high cholesterol here. Here's a prescription for Lipitor. You go, you get a bottle, take off the cap and you take a pill. It's over. Same thing with blood pressure, diabetes, Parkinson. In our primary care practice, people will say, okay, Dr. Weiss, I have high cholesterol or diabetes or Parkinson. I don't want to take a pill. I want to do it myself with lifestyle change, but it's difficult. It, you know, we give you stuff to read. We, we to show you, we'll give you recipes, but it takes more than that. It takes, it takes support. And so we have programs that are this support and you'll see them on our website. The, 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 like most comprehensive one is called the 365 PBI, plant-based immersion. We believe it takes one year, an entire year of being immersed in a dedicated manner in a plant-based uh, construct in order to be stable. Not one month, not three months, six months, it's one year. So uh, that's the overall program. And then we have uh, pieces we have the 30 day detox, which you can just get your uh, alone. That's the first month where it's for people who are, are very aggressive, who really want to dive in very focused, eating like very high level immediately. For that, we, we use that really some, a lot of times for very sick people who must get better quickly. And then with that 30 day detox, we demonstrate how well you're getting with bookended blood tests with all kinds of inflammatory markers. I talked about that damaged oxidized cholesterol, you know, myeloperoxase, all kinds of markers in your blood. We show you how in between one and 30 days you can change. And then following that, we have this ascent you mentioned. The ascent takes somebody from this drastic 30 day detox cleansing and puts them on the road to magnificence of a fully realized, mature, plant-based lifestyle. It takes two months. We add one food back at a time. One, you get to choose them, but we keep you going. You, with all the coaching support, we, we, we teach people how to cook these things, how they should eat them. So, but, so the 30-day detox is the first month. The, the two months that follow is the ascent, the one you mentioned. And then mm -hmm. after that, then we work on other things. By then the person's really eating pretty well. We work on their fitness. We get them evaluated with fitness. We may do other things with sleep and all kinds of other, you know, continue to work on their fitness, weight loss, other kinds of things during the year. So um, those are the components. We also have a, a very simple program, which is called two week the two week challenge by Dr. Weiss. That's a self-directed thing. It's on our website. If you want to get a flavor of what we do, and even if you have friends who, oh my God, I don't want to eat these leaves for the rest of my life. It gives them an opportunity to just take a little sample. Maybe, you know what, just give up the eggs and bacon for breakfast and maybe just have some oatmeal and fruit. You can still have your hamburger for lunch. So it, it's a graded way that they can participate. And then, of course, we have amazing coaching support. If you don't want a program, we just have amazing coaches that you can just call up and talk to them for 30 minutes and get you on the right track or an hour. So we have all these different ways of taking care of people. So they're all parts of our programs. Okay, thank you. Um, with Currently only 15 acres at Ethos Farm currently used for crops. Where do you see the farm going in the next five to seven years? You know, we have, our farm is 342 acres. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's probably not the biggest farm in, in South Carolina, but it's, <laughs> it's pretty big in New Jersey. Um, it's a large farm in New Jersey. And a half of this farm is covered by forest, which we intend to keep it like that because in our forest, the springs erupt through the forest and form the Raritan River. We have the headwaters of the Raritan, which provides a million and a half people downstream with drinking water. So we mm -hmm. want to make sure it's clean. So we preserve that forest. 
The other half, about another 170 acres, are these prime soils, which have been abused for many years, which we're restoring. So 15 of them, they're already restored. They're certified organic, and that's where we grow our vegetables and fruit. We're working on the, the, the remaining like uh, 140 mm -hmm. through these projects I described to you, like through with Rodale, through planting native grasses, uh, to establishing habitat. And if you want to go to our website, you can read about them under Ethos Farm Project. And mm -hmm. our objective is to someday, maybe in the next decade or so, give this land to our young farmers and let them grow whole plant foods without chemicals and renew our soil. Not a mining operation, but a renewing, regenerative operation. And being a food shed for Long Valley, Northern New Jersey, and New York City. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I will turn it back to Ross. Uh, thank you, Carla. Doctor, I have two other questions that popped up yeah. to me on a chat. If you could answer these really quickly. One is, what's the difference between organic and regenerative organic? And the second one is, I know you touched on it, but I, this is the question that comes up every time we have a presenter. What's your opinion of people using oil? Okay. So I thought it was going to be, where do I get my protein from? <laughs> Not with it, <laughs> we know. That one's an old one. You know that one already. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me do the oil one first. How about that? Okay. So, uh, yeah, oil is no good because of, look what I showed you on that chart, right? So it's not just soybean oil. If you looked on that chart, you know, there's other oils there like safflower oil, sunflower oil. Like if you look at bags of chips, they have those oils in them. Sunflower and safflower oil have even more linoleic inflammatory acid that clogs up your arteries and gets you to be overweight than does soybean oil. We just don't eat as much of it, but it's still there. Oil, even, so then you'll say, oh, Dr. Weiss, but I use only the finest extra virgin olive oil. Okay, okay, it doesn't have linoleic acid in it, but it is categorized as a junk food. Did you know that, Ross? Olive oil, extra virgin, very expensive, $30 a bottle is a junk food. The definition of a junk food is a food that gives you a lot of calories, but no nutrients, like cotton candy, candy bars, ice cream, you know, chocolate cake, junk food, chips, right? That's what olive oil is. One, it's the, it has more calories per spoon than any other food I know. 120 calories for a little spoon, and it has no nutrients to speak of. It has maybe a little vitamin E, Where's the protein? You know, where's the carbohydrates? Where's the vitamins? Where's the minerals? It has nothing. And we know now there's studies that show that even after 30 minutes or an hour after eating extra virgin olive oil, your arteries start to go into spasm and constrict. And if you like eating a salad every day, which is good for plant eaters, and if you just put some vinaigrette on it with olive oil, you may be eating like an extra 1,200, 1,500 calories per week, day. Just in that dressing, that's like an extra day of food. You don't want that if you're overweight. Okay, so that's my olive oil, my oil answer. You asked, what's the difference between organic and regenerative organic? Um, so remember I told you that Rodale it invented this term organic. In the 1980s, the USDA came to Rodale and said, hey, we want to use this term organic, and we want to create a, a procedure for certification. So they did, and they screwed it up. <laughs> they, Rodale became very unhappy because they, they allowed some pesticides, they allowed some broad spectrum things. As long as they came from, derived from plants, they allowed them. But it wasn't really healthy farming. Today, USDA certification allows hydroponics, organic. Like you can grow cucumbers or tomatoes in complete water without any soil and nutrients, and they're still organic. Rodale doesn't like that. So because of all these problems, 
where the organic certification no longer determines whether the food you eat is highly grown with high nutrients, they created regenerative. Regenerative guarantees that the soil you're growing in is living, there are no chemicals that are applied, um, and that the people who grow the food are treated not enslaved. It, it's all like a healthcare system, that it's fair. Um, and so that's regenerative organic. In order to be certified regenerative organic, first you need the USDA organic, and then you can be certified regenerative. So as soon as that comes out, we hope our farm will get that certification. Doctor, it was definitely worth our price of admission to hear you, hear, listen, and learn from you tonight. We definitely thank you, not only for the work you're doing, but for the work your entire staff is doing on that farm. It, was, it is definitely an eye-opening presentation you gave tonight, and I am so glad we were able to reach you. Oh, and I'm so glad I was able to spend this time with you. And you, have an, you guys have an open invitation to come to the farm anytime. I know it's kind of tough now with COVID, but someday we will have some beautiful events on the farm and you should all make it up here. You know, New Jersey, it's a nice place. <laughs> it, it's, did you know that tourism is our number four industry? <laughs> Uh, hopefully, the Ethos Farm will be your number one tourist attraction when that comes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.